Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Education USA Zambia, together with Education USA Malawi, presentation on US student visas. Uh, today, we have a, a great presentation planned for you. We are going to talk about the student visa process, all the steps and considerations that you'll need to make, as well as updating everyone about the COVID-19 situation and the closures of the consular services and um, answering any questions that you might have about those closures or about anything about the student visa process. So today we have two of our wonderful consular staff here with us. Uh, we have Jasmine Cho. She is the vice consul and she is here in Lusaka um, after completing her first tour as a vice consul at the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia. And she's currently the deputy consular chief and refugee officer at U.S. Embassy Lusaka. And with us today, we also have Alice Musonda, and she is the consular assistant as well as the consular cashier. She's been at the embassy since July of 2004, and um, she is in charge of non-immigrant visa processing and also helps with anti-trafficking policy and programs. So we're very excited to have both Jasmine and Alice with us to answer all of our questions about the student visa process. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn over to um, Jasmine to start our presentation. And I'll just say to our audience members, um, if you can go ahead and stay on mute so that we don't have any background noise. And if you do have questions, um, you can go ahead and post them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end. We'll also have a chance for people to raise their hand and ask questions live um, at any time when, um, when we finish the main presentation. So Jasmine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul uh, and Belita. Thank you for having us on this, uh, this great gathering, albeit it's virtual, uh, but uh, better that than not. So thank you for modern technology. Uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, a little about myself. Um, so uh, before the State Department, I was also, when I was a student a long, long time ago, um, uh, very interested in study abroad. And um, in fact, I studied abroad in elementary school, uh, in high school, in college, and also um, a professional exchange. So I am a big proponent, advocate, as well as uh, uh, one who's also practiced um, studying abroad. So I think for all those of you who are uh, on the fence about it. Uh, it really is a great opportunity. Um, and of course, you know, we're going to talk about student visas to the United States, but uh, wherever it may be, uh, I think getting outside of your, your town, your country, um, to see what it's like outside, uh, it really gives you a great perspective and also helps you appreciate um, all that you have in your home countries. So a little bit about me. Um, so the presentation, uh, uh, so yes, Allison and I are here representing the consular section for the U.S. Embassy. Uh, the Bureau of Consular Affairs, uh, which is within the Department of State, it provides uh, consular services uh, to protect U.S. citizens, uh, our interests abroad, and to ensure uh, U.S. border security, um, as well as facilitating entry of legitimate travelers. So every prospective traveler to the United States, uh, they undergo extensive security screening. Uh, we have to ensure that applicants um, seeking to travel to the U.S., you know, whatever their purpose may be, uh, are qualified to receive visas um, and that they do not pose a threat to the security. Um, so for applicants who are qualified to receive visas, uh, we want to facilitate their travel. Uh, we know that facilitating student and exchange uh, visitor visas uh, to qualified applicants, it results in numerous benefits. Uh, it's a positive effect on our foreign policy, uh, as well as the U.S. image abroad. Uh, but probably most importantly, uh, for students who study in the United States, uh, it gives you an opportunity to learn about another country as well as um, the benefits of that experience when you bring that home to your home country, whether it is professionally, personally, 
Um, so we feel that this is a really a, a great opportunity for, for many, for both the U.S. as well as students who are interested in studying the U.S. All right, if you can go to the next slide. Oh, so these are the topics that we'll cover, as, as Paul mentioned already. All right, so what is a visa? Um, we don't know this person. This is a generic photo. <laughs> uh, so basically, this is an example of what a visa looks like. It's, uh, um, it's basically a sticker that is placed in the passport. Uh, a visa gives students the ability to come to the United States, uh, apply for entry from the Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection officials uh, at the port of entry, uh, which in most cases, this will be at the airport. Um, a visa does not guarantee that uh, the visa recipient will be granted entry. The decision is made by the Customs and Border Protection official. So this is something to keep in mind. All right, next slide. All right, so these are the different student visa classifications. Um, a majority of student visas are F visas. Uh, these are students who uh, are pursuing degrees at academic institutions, usually universities, uh, community colleges, uh, language programs. Uh, there's also um, the J visas, which are um, exchange visitors. They could be secondary school students, college university students, um, non-degree students as well uh, for professional exchanges. And then there's the M visa, which is vocational or other non-academic students. So, um, for short periods of recreational study, and by that I mean um, study that is not for credit, uh, not for credit towards a degree or an academic certificate, uh, these actually, uh, the, the more appropriate visa may be a visitor's visa, uh, which is a B visa. And so um, it permits, uh, the B visa allows you to enroll in a short recreational course of study. Um, if you want to learn more about visitors visa, you can go to our, our embassy website as well as travel.state.gov, um, and we'll give you more resources uh, at the end of the at the end of the um, slide deck. So, um, and then you can also ask your school if you're not sure as well, and they will know what visa class applies to. All right, next slide. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Alice, my colleague, and she'll talk about the visa process. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see all of you. So the visa process is as follows. Visa adjudications are the same all over the world at all our embassies, but then the processes differ. Just like appointment systems, they can differ. So we use an appointment system that's uh, called uh, GSS. When you log on to our website, I'll run through the steps after this slide. I'll show you how you can go through the process. But what I can tell you is that you need to apply early for your student visa um, in terms of set up an appointment early so that you don't, you're not stuck in a position where you will eventually be late for your classes because we do not want that. Um, we can only issue a visa 120 days before your program start date. Having said that, you can only travel to the U.S. 30, 30 days before the program starts. So even if you get the visa four months before, you can only travel a month before. Uh, for J-1 exchange visitor visas, you can, you can be issued the visa as soon as you get your DS-2019. For the F-1, of course, you get the I-20. Next slide. So here's the process. Uh, step one, you can log on to our website, which is zm.usembassy.gov. Under the non-immigrant visas tab, you'll find the steps outlined. So first, you fill in the DS-160. That's our online visa application form. Once you do that, you need to log into another website, which is listed on step two on the website. It will run you through the, uh, it will, you need to create an account where you pay the fee at Zambia National Commercial Bank. Any Zanaco branch across Zambia will be able to receive this money. So the instruction sheet will tell you how much you go and pay at the bank. Make sure that you pay that exact amount or else it will just mess up the whole scheduling process. 
So once you pay the fee after two business days, you'll be able to receive a notification to say that you can now schedule an appointment. How, once you've set up your appointment, you should also pay the service fee. Service fee is um, an amount of money that you need to pay to DHS for monitoring your status in the US as a student. For students, it's $350. For J's, it is $200. In terms of your passport, make sure that your passport is valid for at least six months after you arrive in the US. If it is not, then you need to plan on applying for a new passport. So now, next slide, please. So here's what we need. As I said, you need to have a passport which is valid for at least six months at the time of travel. Another thing that you need is a photo. As you can see on the slides, it is centered. The size of the photo is two inches by two inches. He's not smiling and it's clear. We can see all his important features. We can see the ears, the mouth, the eyes clearly. And then you need to come with a DS-160 confirmation page. This is the page that comes up once you've completed the online application form. Most times we get, well, not most times, sometimes we get applicants who come to the consular section without the page. Uh, but then that only means it's either they did not finish completing the DS-160 or they did finish, but they forgot to print out the page. So make sure that you print out this page because it makes processing visas much, much easier and quicker. If you're going as, a, as an F or M student, you need to have your I-20, a form I-20. If you're going as a J, we call it a DS-2019. So this form I-20, you need to keep it very carefully, very securely, and we need the originals. I know sometimes you get scanned copies, but you still need to receive the original uh, using um, mail, express mail. The original will, be, will have the signature of your school official and then your signature as well. It will tell you, it will tell us, the course of study and how long and how much it, it is. Yeah. And then you also need to come with a receipt for the visa application fee, which is currently going at $160, and the receipt for the service fee, which I said was $300, $350. If you need more, uh, to know more about more uh, information that you need to bring, you can visit our website. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. All right. So uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, so I'll take it from here. <clears throat> so uh, you've uh, done all the, the paperwork, prepared your documents. Now you come to the interview. Um, so the question is, what is it that a consular officer is looking for? Um, four things. Uh, first of all, it's a chance for you to tell us uh, who you are and what your story is. Um, everybody's story is a little different, uh, so we uh, always encourage applicants to think through, uh, you know, their story. And um, it's always tempting to try to think, you know, well, what, what is it that they want to hear? But really, it's best if you just come with um, your story, your thoughts, where, where you're coming from, and why you're interested in studying in the U.S. Secondly, um, what do you want to do? What is it that you plan to study? Um, and why. And it's, it's great to, like I said, to be honest and specific uh, and, and really show us how it applies to you personally. Uh, thirdly, how are you going to fund it? Uh, so it's great if you bring, uh, including the application documents, um, proof of uh, financial documents, liquid assets that you have uh, or your family has to cover your first year. Um, and plans for uh, the remaining year of the program. And lastly, what you intend to do when you've completed your proposed activity. So all of these things, uh, so these four questions are really the key questions um, that you should think about uh, and, and really think through. Um, and we know that there's a lot of information that's it's on the internet regarding visa interviews. Uh, unfortunately, very little of it is actually true. Uh, it's best uh, to refer to the U.S. government 
uh, official sources and websites, uh, which again, we'll share with you at the end of this presentation. All right, next slide. Okay, so possible outcomes. Uh, uh, one outcome is that you will, uh, your visa will be approved and uh, you can go on to study in the United States. Um, the second outcome is you, your visa may be refused and there's three different common refusals. Um, most common uh, is uh, refusal under Section 214B of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, basically, Section 214B uh, presumes every non-immigrant visa applicant to be an intending immigrant, and it places the burden of disproving this presumption um, on the applicant. So in adjudicating non-immigrant visa applications, consular officers examine each application individually to determine whether the applicant qualifies for visa issuance according to our immigration law. Uh, applicants for student visas uh, have to further demonstrate uh, and, um, that they meet the student visa requirements, such as having a residence abroad uh, with possessing sufficient funds, like we said before, to pursue the proposed uh, course. Uh, now, the second category is 221G, and this basically means that um, your case requires further administrative processing. Uh, and it basically means that um, there may be some questions about the applicant's eligibility um, or other questions that have to be resolved uh, by us, perhaps, um, in order to, to overcome 221G. So uh, whatever that reason may be, um, during the interview, you will be, the applicant will be informed of what will happen, whether they need to provide additional information or documents, or if they need to wait until they hear back from the concert section. Um, so the team of the of administrative processing is individual, it's dependent on the circumstance, so there's no blanket uh, time frame for that. Lastly, uh, you can also use under 212A, uh, and this is uh, due to ineligibilities uh, such as DUIs, uh, driving under the influence, drug possession, um, other uh, criminal activity. It's very important that students are completely honest and tell the truth that um, there are certain situations where we uh, will be able to work with the applicant um, as long as they're upfront with us. Um, and another side note is for those students who do get a visa um, to study in the United States, it's really important that you also abide by um, all the laws. Uh, and because it's, if you do um, get involved in a legal altercation, or custody, um, that could definitely affect whether or not your visa will be renewed or when you apply for any other visa um, in the future. Uh, so, all, uh, all, all denial of refusals, um, you will receive a letter from the U.S. Embassy Consulate explaining and citing the section of the law uh, that you're being refused under. Like I said, 214B, 221G, or 212A. Um, it is not going to list the reason why that section of the law was applied to the individual, but what law uh, was um, was basically applicable for the refusal. And uh, the visa record, again, it's confidential. Uh, and in the future, after the interview, uh, we are unable to discuss the details of specific cases with anyone besides uh, the applicant themselves. So, all right, next slide. Okay, and I'll turn it again to Alice to talk about after the visa issuance. Hello again. So once you've uh, received your visa, you are now good to travel to the U.S. to study. And when you go to the U.S., make sure that you are going there to study as requested. The moment you get out of status, then that will have a problem with uh, future visa applications. 
and then you no longer be in status, meaning you need to go back to your home country, in this case, Zambia and Malawi. So once you travel to the state, you, uh, you study, you complete your degree, what's next? You have the option of applying for work, what we call optional practical training, OPT. So this is um, work related to your major area of study, and it can last for up to 12 months. Sometimes it, it can be authorized uh, before you complete your studies. Most times it's after. But then if it is during your studies, it can be no more than 20 hours a week. Um, yeah, so that's that about optional practical training. Next slide, over to Jasmine. One thing I actually, if you uh, don't mind, uh, one thing I wanted to address about OPT is, um, so F1 students, uh, they, they are um, not, um, authorized to work off campus during the first academic year, uh, but they may accept on campus employment. Um, after the first year, they can participate in um, some sort of practical training, CPT or OPT, uh, but that, this has to be pre authorized by mm -hmm. the school um, as well as the IS. So it is not the, the consular section or the US Embassy that authorizes it. This is something that the student has to work out with the school official and USCIS. So just wanted to add at that one point. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jasmine. No problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Some visa that are out there. Uh, I addressed one of these already that, that there is no right or wrong answer for interviews. Um, it's best for everyone to, to just be upfront and to be authentic and, and just tell them. Uh, secondly, uh, you don't have to go to a university. That is not what, uh, that is not the only category of visa uh, that we issue. It's, uh, you can get a visa to attend any size, uh, public, private, uh, as long as it is a service approved school. And uh, if it's not a service approved school, you won't be getting an I-20, which should be an indicator that it's, it's not a student visa that you're, you're applying for. Um, Thirdly, uh, there is a myth that it's better to pay a, a fixer, uh, like a visa fixer. And, and there's unfortunately a slew of them um, available uh, and eager to provide uh, mostly false information. So um, they for the adjudication, they have no inside information on the process. So uh, it's best to, it's, it's best to rely on US government uh, as well as um, other resources that are federally sanctioned. And again, these uh, links will provide at the end of this slide. Lastly, uh, international students are very welcome to the United States. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, they are value members of our by diversity and exposure to the world. Uh, and it is, university would not be the same without international students um, on their campuses. So uh, they are most welcome to the United States. All right, next. So another uh, and visas. Um, so unfortunately due to the ongoing COVID pandemic, all routine visa services worldwide uh, to include obviously the U.S. Embassy in Lusaka have been suspended uh, student visas. Uh, we understand that this places these students here and across the world in tough situations, especially if their schools are scheduled to start um, the academic year. Um, many schools are either not opening for in-person classes, they're starting virtually, uh, opening with the option of either, uh, or they're just delaying our date. Um, all we can say from the embassy is uh, to continue to check our website uh, for information on when visa services will resume uh, and to get in touch with your respective universities and schools to inform them um, of the current situation. Uh, more information on this can be found on the travel.state.gov uh, website. Um, the link there is pretty long, but Google travel.state.gov, then it'll take you straight to the website. And then within there, 
there should be links to the COVID-19 updates on visas. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, additionally to COVID-19, uh, on June 22nd, President Trump signed a proclamation suspending entry into the United States uh, of certain immigrant and non-immigrants uh, who present uh, a risk to the U.S. labor market following the coronavirus outbreak. It's effective June 24th until December 31st, unless um, it is continued by the president. Um, for student visas, uh, it specifically affects the J visa applicants, basically um, those participating in internships, uh, trainees, teachers, camp counselors, au pairs, um, and other summer work travel program participants. Uh, the good thing is um, it's, if you already have a visa, a valid visa, it will, um, it's not going to be revoked uh, because of this proclamation. Um, also US citizens, uh, lawful permanent residents and aliens who are uh, or were inside the United States, um, uh, those holding these visas uh, are not subject to the proclamation. Uh, more information on the proclamation is available uh, on the White House website. Um, again, I apologize that the link tends to be very long, uh, but if you uh, went to the whitehouse.gov and then within presidential actions, um, there should be a link to the presidential proclamation 10014. All right. Next slide. Uh, here are the resources, uh, the online resources uh, available from both uh, the State Department, uh, Department of Homeland Security, and um, U.S. Customs Enforcement. Talk specifically about student visas, and um, I'm pretty sure Paul. Is there a way yeah. that this can be posted? Yeah, um, Jasmine, I'll, I'll try to put these in the chat um, after, when we get to the question section and um, we'll also share them um, maybe on Facebook as well. Perfect. Yeah, only because if I know if anybody else is like me, there's no way I can write things as fast as it's put up on board. I was a terrible note taker in school. This is a, a skill set that is undervalued and you'll realize this once you're in school. All right. Uh, and uh, the next slide, it shows um, just resources from the embassy. It's easier to access, actually, if you just go to the zm.usembassy.gov um, uh, under the visas category. Um, all the information that Alice and I provided should be there, as well as uh, links um, that would be relevant to um, your questions. So, and with that, uh, that's the end of our, our formal part. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'll definitely uh, look forward to helping and answering those questions. All right, great. Thanks so much, Jasmine. Thank you, Alice, for the, um, the great overview of the student visa process. Um, it was definitely helpful to have sort of um, that broad overview and to understand the steps for student visa. Um, I do understand that our participants have uh, many questions. A few have been asked in the chat. Um, and then we also had some questions that were posted in the registration. And I'm sure there are some live questions as well. So let's go ahead and get started on some of those questions. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the presentation. I will post some of those links in the chat in just a moment, but um, I think it'll be easier if we can see everyone's faces. So um, let's go ahead and start. I think a few people um, missed a little bit of information in the presentation. So I'll just ask mm -hmm. a, question, a couple questions from the chat that people wanted some clarification on. Um, the first question from Agnes asks um, about paying for the visa application fee. Is there some sort of account or um, process for opening an account that needs to happen. Okay, thanks for that question. So yes, re remember I had said that you need to go to step two on our website of the instructions. And then when you create an account and provide your email address, 
instructions will be sent to you. So the inst instructions include the account and the amount. So you take that instruction sheet to Zanaco and that's where you uh, proceed uh, to, pay, to make payment. And also I'll take this opportunity to specify that the visa application fee is different from the service fee. So these are two different amounts payable to two different agencies. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Next I was on. Question. I was on. I was on mute there for a second. Sorry about that. Oh, um, okay. The second question was just from someone that joined a little bit late. Um, I, it says, "What is required for a visa to be processed?" Which is a pretty broad question. So, um, probably. I would recommend them to um, to visit the website that was mentioned, the U.S. Embassy website, mm -hmm. which will cover all the steps that were discussed in the presentation, so we don't have to repeat that information. Um, we'll also um, probably post a link to the full visa video that of uh, this workshop um, a little bit later on Facebook in a couple of days. So please check on Facebook mm -hmm. for that link. All right, we have a couple of questions from Malawi. Um, our uh, our colleagues in Malawi, our fellow students, ask if a school is opening up for the fall, but consular services in country are still suspended, will the student need to get a new I-20? So if they've already been issued an I-20 and say consular services take some more months to open up, um, how long is that I-20 valid, valid for? Depending on the course of study, um generally like we said it's not good to be late for school so you may need to ask for a new i-20 giving you a new start date because really you can't go to school after the recommended start date so basically if the, the does the i-20 have a start date on it or has a it says the student yes. starting and okay yes the so I if they start does later have a start that later date. than the, the start date then they would need to get a new i-20 Yes, it depends with how late we're talking. If it's probably one or two weeks late, they need to ask the school if they can still travel. If it's more than that, then they will probably need to get a new I-20. That may be like three months late, yeah, they need a new I-20. And the other thing is, uh, so the I-20 is not just, you know, we look at it obviously for our, um, our visa interview, but it's essentially a document that they have to present to CBP when they reach the, um, the airport, uh, the border patrol, and they will look at that and say, looks like you, the program already started a month ago, two months ago. And so um, that could uh, pose a problem for entry to the United States, even if you had a valid visa. So it's, it's mm -hmm. best like Said to reach out to the school and to um, determine um, the, the steps on getting a new I-20. Good question though. Yeah, it's a great question. And um, like Jasmine said, you know, the schools and universities are aware that this is an issue for students around the mm -hmm. world. It's not just here in Zambia or Malawi. Um, so definitely reach out to the schools if you're confused about things like the I-20 or your start date or um, what's going to happen if, if um, things are delayed because the schools are going to be dealing with this for all their international students and they can they may not have answers right this minute because things are changing every every week uh, with the COVID-19 situation but as it gets closer to school start date I'm sure they'll they'll have a plan in place for students that um, aren't able to start in August. Okay um, there was another question from Malawi. Um, mm -hmm. Student says, I graduated in May and had plans to make return home, but with the travel suspensions and closed borders, I worry that it will hurt my profile if I overstayed my visa dates. What should I do? I assume this is a student that is already in the US. Um, that's what it sounds like, that they plan to return home, but because of the closed borders, um, they may have to overstay their visa. Um, I would say in cases like that, it's best to reach out to USCIS this is possible because um, they're the ones that could um, authorize an extension based on COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's the worst case is for you not to reach them and then at some point um, sure. after when you come back to your home country and then you apply for a future visa then there will be a lot of um, paperwork that you'll need, documentation yeah. that you'll need, which um, if you reach out to USCIS uh, while you're in the U.S. now um, all of that could be easily resolved um, and so that it doesn't uh, affect you in the future. 
Um, let's see. The next question asks if um, if you can specify exactly how much in um, Zambian kwacha um, a visa costs. Um, I know there was different parts of the the fees, um, and, and I don't think we covered the exact cost of each part. Okay, sure. So, like I said, the dollar amount is one hundred and sixty dollars, one six zero. The kwacha will depend on the rate at that time. So that instruction sheet will tell you exactly how much you need to pay. So do not assume that the, the, creating the account is important because that way you go to the bank with inform, informed information, accurate information. So that will give you how much you need to pay at the bank, the quarter amount. Please don't go and pay in dollars. It will just confuse the whole process. It will just delay the whole process. Please pay in the quarter amount indicated on the instruction sheet. All right, great, thank you. Um, we have uh, one of our participants and I definitely encourage anyone that would like to ask a live question. We love to see people's faces and hear from you directly. Usually we would do these presentations in person, um, but of course due to COVID we're doing it all virtually. So um, I think Tokosile, um, who's one of our Education USA scholars has a question. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute her and um, she can also share her video if she wishes. <laughs> um, I don't think you can see me, so I just turn off my video. <laughs> oh, we can see you now. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, like, if, for example, let's say we're going for, let's say the embassy opens in, like, October or September or something like that, and that's after we've paid for like tuition and stuff like that. Um, I heard you say you have to show um, like proof of funds, for example, like funds for my tuition. And if I've already paid for my tuition, do I still have to show that I can pay for my tuition or can I just bring like the receipt? Um, so, <laughs> Uh, that's actually a, a good question. Um, so when you come to the interview, normally uh, you provide bank statements or other uh, source of funding to prove you have um, the funds to pay for the tuition. Um, what we tell applicants is uh, until you have a visa, until your visa uh, that you should not uh, pay for a program because you may or may not get the visa. So. Uh, if you don't get the visa and you pay the funds and perhaps it's a program that does not refund you, uh, then now you're sort of stuck in a, uh, in a tight spot. So um, our, our instructions always is not to pay for anything, not to book travel reservations, not to do anything um, until you have a visa. So uh, proof of payment is great, but then if you uh, don't get the visa, then now you're stuck. So again, it's it's best to just come with financial documents showing that you have the funds, uh, but not to pay for anything until you have a visa. Did that answer your question, Toko Sile? Do you have any follow up or? Oh, Are you still there, Toko Sile? Anything else, or is that? I think that answered her question. Okay. So okay. it, great. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, let's say I start like online lessons. Oh, hello. Yeah, uh, we can hear you now. Can go you ahead. hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if I start online like lessons and everything, I'm not sure if I have to pay for tuition either way, if you know what I mean. So in that case, what happens? Yeah, we're, we're really going into uncharted territory. Um, so uh, if, you are, if you are enrolled in the school and they offer you online classes, uh, then obviously uh, that doesn't require a visa. Um, but uh, you really do need to talk with the school about uh, the fact that you don't have a visa, you're taking classes online because of COVID-19, 
Uh, but uh, in the future, when you do apply for these, what are sort of the the left and right limits uh, for what the school can do, uh, you know, in the off chance that you don't get a visa. Uh, can you continue your studies online? Um, are the credits still transferable? Um, all of those questions you'll have to ask with uh, the school that you're applying or you're attending. Okay, thank you. Thank you, good questions though. Yeah, thanks, Tokasile, um, for your questions. I think um, Agnes, um, who uh, is also another Education USA member, um, has a few questions. Agnes, would you like to ask your questions live? Yes, no problem. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so my first question was to do with the visa application fee. Do you think it's a good idea to pay it now, considering that the consulates are closed and it's non-refundable? <laughs> Uh, well, if you plan on being interviewed for a visa, then yes, it's a good idea to start planning now. And then you schedule an appointment. Then once the calendar is open, you can choose a date closer to your start date. So planning early is always best. So that you're not stuck in the jam once the consulate's open, once the embassies are open. Yeah. If I could jump in, I would say planning is great. But just like I said before, don't book travel, don't make reservations that you cannot cancel or get refunded for. So um, mm -hmm. is, is definitely the uh, best thing to do, but, but don't, um, don't make any plans that are, are, are concrete and, and hard and cannot be changed. Okay, thank you. And also, also the, the fee is valid for one year. So even if you pay now and you don't manage to schedule an appointment now, you can wait until you get a new I-20, if at all that you won't manage to make the start date this particular time. Um, I think Agnes had another question in the chat, um, which I think is a, an interesting question. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. sure one that you probably have gotten and probably maybe can't answer, but um, she's asking if, um, is there any chance that students will get visas for this year's fall semester? And I guess maybe you could think of this question like how long typically visas take? You know, what would be the latest date that students could start in August or September? I don't know if you want to speculate or just, you know, or not, but uh, I'll throw that out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, there's really nothing more, no more information that we have besides what we've already put um, but we can't speculate anything at this point. Uh, COVID-19 is um, affecting the whole world, uh, not just uh, the United States. And so um, because of that, uh, uh, not just consular services, but schools themselves uh, are, are in sort of a flux. Um, they can't, even if um, uh, students were accepted, you know, in the spring, uh, every week, every month, almost, they are having to update uh, what it is their plan is for the fall. Uh, so there, there is no concrete estimate date projection. Um, all we can do is uh, just be alert and ready. And, um, and as Alice uh, had sort of given the rundown of the documents that you need to have, just making sure that you know, your passports are ready to go, your, your documents, your school documents, your financial documents, all of that is ready so that um, the minute the, the, the visa restrictions are lifted, um, you're, you're ready to start. Um, you're not scrounging at the last minute at that point. So uh, being prepared is, I think, the best thing uh, we all can do at this time. All right, great. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, I think um, just sort I of had, on that oh, same note. I have note. a follow-up oh. question. Go ahead, Agnes. Oh, thank you. Um, I was going to also ask about the, sorry. Oh. It's all right, go ahead, we can hear you. Oh, oh, sorry. I was going to ask about how you prove your finance, like you prove you can pay. So 
if you are on a full scholarship and maybe your scholarship is also going to pay for your flight, do you still need to submit financial documentation showing that, I don't know, do you still need to prove that you can pay for your uh, that's a good question. So uh, if you have a scholarship, then obviously your scholarship documents is your financial proof of payment. Uh, so um, you wouldn't need anything uh, besides that. But some people do and doesn't, it never hurts to have additional financial documents. Uh, but also keep in mind, uh, the consular officer may or may not ask for any of these documents. Uh, the interview, um, the, the questions that you answered may be sufficient and not require any additional documents. So, uh, but it's always best to provide or bring the documents um, in case it's asked for. Um, definitely scholarship documents, definitely bank statements, anything else that could support your case. Thank you. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, as a follow-up to that question, so if a student gets a scholarship offer, Basically, the um, um, the I twenty document should tell them exactly how much of the total cost of university attendance, including room and board, that the university is paying, and then should say how much that the student is responsible for. Is that correct? And then the student needs to show you proof that they can pay what they're responsible for. That's correct. Yes, the I-20 does uh, specify uh, what portion, uh, if they are receiving a scholarship, what portion of the tuition it covers, and then it also shows the remainder that is the responsibility of the student. So, uh, so yes, definitely in those cases, for sure, they should bring financial documents to show how they would pay for the remainder. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got some more questions in the chat here. Um, I think um, the, just one of the questions was just if the embassy in Zambia is open now. I think we answered that during the presentation that currently the embassy and consular services are closed. Um, definitely check the U.S. Embassy Zambia or U.S. Embassy Malawi page, depending on where you're located, um, to see when um, we'll, we'll post there as soon as consular services and other embassy services are reopened. Um, we don't have any timing for when that will happen. So um, as soon as it's, it happens, we will post it there immediately. So, and probably also on our Facebook page, I would guess we'll post a, a notice about the uh, resuming of services. All right, so um, here's a good question um, from Chomba. Uh, ask, uh, how exactly does one show that they do intend to come back home? Um, do they ask you if you plan on coming back to your home country um, or the interviewers, can they, do they ask you that question directly in the interview or do they, can they just tell from their interactions with you? How do you determine that someone will come back home? Well, um, we would love to say that we have a machine that reads people's minds. <laughs> Generally, that's not the case. Uh, it, it's a one-on-one -on -one rapport that, that um, the applicant has with the consular officer. So it's the conversation and the questions that come from it uh, uh, that would provide uh, enough um, information for the consular officer to make a decision on whether or not um, the student or visa applicant uh, has enough ties to their home country that would induce them to come back um, or if they don't. And so there is no um, set of questions that are answered or asked at all times. Uh, it really is a one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, and um, there are no set questions or answers. Uh, would it be fair though to say, Jasmine or Alice, that the, the questions are, you know, meant to, to get direct, uh, you know, be direct questions that there's not like trick questions or, or they're not trying to, you know, trick students in any way? Uh, no. Mm. no trick questions. No. Um, it's, it's really the interview is an opportunity for the students to tell us about themselves, their plans, um, and, and why they want to study in the U.S. So uh, it's, it's of, of all visa interviews, it's probably the most straightforward, I would say. Mm -hmm. And if I can also add that um, having an I-20 is not a guarantee for getting a visa to the US and that's why we do the interviews. And like Jasmine says, the interviews are straightforward. So the questions are pretty basic. It's either you qualify or you don't qualify. 
and that is determined right then and there. Great, thank you, Alice. A um, couple more questions from the chat. Um, uh, Kuya asks, how long does a visa process take from start to finish? Uh, generally, um, once you schedule an appointment, for instance, if you, once you pay at the bank, you wait for two to three business days, then you're interviewed on one day, you get your visa back the next day. So generally it's 24 hours. You interviewed on one day, you get a visa back the next day after your appointment date. Great, thank you. Um, so some more specific questions um, from Palav. Um, has a couple questions. Maybe Palav, would it be okay if you ask your questions live since they're kind of long and, and specific? I can unmute you. Go ahead, you're, uh, you're, you're on, Palav. Uh, Palav, you can go ahead and speak. I don't know, if, can we hear you? I think it's coming on now, let's see. Having a little trouble getting you. Okay, we can, oh, there we go. Let's see. Go ahead, go ahead with your question. Maybe having some trouble with the audio there. So um, let's see. I can go ahead and ask the questions uh, in place uh, since the audio doesn't seem to be working. That's fine. Um, Okay, so Palav asks um, that um, I've been issued my I-20 and I've ordered to get it shipped to here in Malawi. Um, what is the next process to follow before I get my visa interview date scheduled? Um, so I guess the question is basically, is there anything else once they've got their I-20, are there any other steps or preparation they can do while they're waiting for a visa interview? Well, they can fill in the visa application form, the DS-160. And then if you are applying from Lusaka, you follow the instructions of making payment at Zambia National Commercial Bank. And then you select the next available date in the calendar. And then you wait until the, the embassy is open. That's not to say that the date you choose is when you'll be interviewed, but it's just a matter of securing a date until the embassy is open. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Alice. So you can, fill, can start filling out the form. Um, I would also add to that, um, just staying in touch with your university uh, during the time while we're waiting for the embassies to reopen to see what the university, how their plans are changing as um, time goes on and the coronavirus situation continues. So definitely keep, keep updated con uh, consistently with your university, check their website, um, check their Facebook or Twitter pages for updates about their start dates and um, what type of learning they're gonna have in person or online. Um, Palab also asked um, that um, they're actually an Indian uh, citizen, um, but uh, were, came uh, back to Malawi in January due to COVID and unable to get back to India. So the question is, can they get their visa from any consulate or embassy anywhere in the world? Uh, generally, it's best to apply from your home country, but in this case, obviously, due to COVID, everyone is stuck where they would rather not be. So, um, your options are either to wait until you're able to go back and apply from your home country where you can convince the consular officer that you're going to return after your uh, studies, or you apply from here, but then there's not, it's not a guarantee that you will get it we always advise for you to apply from your home country. All right, thank you, Alice. Um, You're welcome. So um, another question here, I think this is kind of, you, you talked to, uh, Jasmine talked about it a little bit in the presentation, but um, I don't know if there's any more specific information about student visas. Um, the question is, what are some of the common causes for visa rejection? And maybe another way to phrase this question is, you know, what's some advice you have for students as they approach their, their visa to, um, 
to have the best chance of, of being issued a visa. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, I think there is a right or wrong answer, but uh, it's uh, best to be prepared to interview, um, know about, uh, and it's kind of silly to say, but know yourself, <laughs> understand what it is that uh, uh, motivates you, why you're motivated to study in the United States uh, or whatever program it is, uh, and be able to present that. And um, being authentic and honest is, is the best way. Um, uh, so the opposite would be, so if you're not honest, not prepared, don't know the program, all of these things mm -hmm. obviously would lead to uh, not as positive uh, outcome in the interview. So. Great. And that was uh, anything else, Jasmine, you can add about common rejections that you see for student visas or just things that, that students often, mm -hmm. you know, are rejected for? Uh, like I said, it's it's uh, not being prepared, not having uh, documents, not having an idea of why they're studying in the U.S. Um, besides, it's the first university that I found on Google. <laughs> so, um, so again, as Alice said, uh, getting accepted to a program or school in the United States uh, is just one step. Uh, the next step uh, for the visa is um, showing that you are a genuine student with concrete plans um, and aspirations um, and how this study fits into that, how it makes sense uh, to you as an individual uh, and, and not that's generic. Uh, everybody wants opportunities uh, or study abroad uh, is something that's positive, but how does it apply to you? Why is it important to you? Um, and how did you come to make this decision. So um, all of these things help your case. Uh, there, there is no, um, like I said, there is no set answer or, or um, response that we're looking for. Uh, response that is authentic and true to you is uh, the, best, the best way to approach it. Great, thanks Jasmine. Um, I'm just posting here um, the, the link for the um, US Embassy Zambia visa page in the chat section. So that will have links to um, most of the, the things we discussed today, um, including overviews of the information that was discussed. So please do visit that um, uh, at any time um, to get updates about the visa process, about closures and, and everything related to that. So um, let's see, uh, another question about a student kind of being displaced um, Kuya asks that, uh, says they're in South Africa stuck in lockdown. Um, is there any other means of payment they can use apart from depositing in Zanaco? Um, unfortunately, no, they aren't. Uh, you have to deposit the physical cash in Zanaco. You can send someone to do it on your behalf. You don't, not, you don't need to do it in person as you, the visa applicant, but make sure that it's your credentials that are being used, you can send someone to deposit on your behalf. Great, thanks Alice. Um, sure. Let's see here. Um, I think um, there is questions um, that were came from the thing. I think we've done most of the questions so far that have come from the chat. Um, so I was going to ask um, a few questions from the um, um, from the comments that had come through. Um, I think one of the main questions that was asked a lot was, um, when the embassy does reopen, is there a way that it's going to be ensured that student visas are processed as quickly as possible? Um, do we anticipate things like an overload in, in the number of visas being requested? Um, how can students ensure that they get priority or, or get their visas processed quickly once visa services resume? Mm -hmm. um, Thank yeah. you. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, uh, I don't have the answer. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
in general, we've always um, prioritized students uh, for applications, uh, visa applications, because we know that they have a, a start date for their program. Uh, and, and so we've always considered them a priority. And I would be, uh, I would not be surprised if um, once we are open, there will be measures in place so that we can um, try to help the students get to where they need to go as soon as possible. So uh, it, it is definitely um, something that, that we're gonna be working on. And so once we can open up, um, you'll find that information hopefully online on our website. Uh, but, but do know that that is a priority in our minds. Great, thanks Jasmine. Um, I think another question that came in um, was about um, visas for um, attending community colleges. Um, are there any special requirements for students attending community colleges versus a four-year college or university? Uh, no, it's the same. Uh, we we uh, consider uh, whether it's a four-year university, community college, uh, language program, it's it's all considered the same. So the preparations and the documents that they'll need to bring are the same. I'm sorry, I was just trying to read the questions there. Um, question, <laughs> I don't remember if we discussed this in the presentation, but um, is there, um, can you discuss at all about work uh, permit um, allowances? Or sorry, I guess the question is about um, when a student gets a student visa, are they allowed to work while they're in the U.S.? Um, I did mention it briefly. Uh, so, um, and again, all of this information is, is available on um, USCIS uh, website as well. Uh, so the work permit and all of that, they, they would have to bring this up with a school official once you're in the United States. And then they would also require you to work this through USCIS. Um, On-campus employment is something that I, I believe you could start as soon as you get there. Off-campus employment, though, mm -hmm. I think it's not allowed the first year. Um, it would mm -hmm. have to be some years, but all of this will have to be discussed with the school official as well as USCIS. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, um, I think we've come to the end of our questions, but if I didn't answer any questions, please feel free. Anyone, you can either raise your hand or repost your question in the chat. I, I might have missed it because there was a lot of questions coming in quickly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, unmute for just a moment here um, Faith Chitawo, who is the Education USA advisor in uh, Education USA Malawi. She just had a, a few pieces of cultural advice for students as they go to approach their visa interviews. So um, go ahead, Faith, uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. If Hi everyone. Your, if you want to share your video, you can. I can't right now, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, no problem. Go ahead. Babe. Hi everyone. Thank you, Jasmine and Alice, for this information. It's very useful. And welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Faith Kitao. I'm the Education USA Advisor here in Malawi. Um, I just wanted to add in, in when. Jasmine and Alice were talking about preparing for the interview. Um, I would also encourage you, if you're going, if you're getting ready for your interview, be confident. The consular officer isn't there to scare you away um, from the process. Be confident because you've gone through this entire process. You know what it is that you're applying for, what program of study you want to pursue. I know culturally, especially for Malawian students, um, we had raised to not but to be very respectful to our elders so we'll speak softly and we'll look down um, but you're going for an interview so be confident look at the consular officer um, because it shows as well in terms of your body language that you know what you're getting you're signing up for as well um, so I just wanted to add that from that cultural perspective that you may think that by looking down um, you're being very respectful towards them, but it might be it might look like you're being shifty. So just be confident, speak to them confidently, um, and you should be fine. They're not there to bite you. That's it. Yeah, definitely not biting. No biting. <laughs> Thanks, Faith. We appreciate it, and we appreciate you joining us as well from Malawi. Um, I think um looks like that's most of our questions. Uh, 
Hong Kong. This is Belita Paul. Yeah, I was going to ask Belita if you wanted to introduce yourself. Uh, go ahead, Belita. I don't know if my audio is any better now. Um, yeah, we can but, hear you pretty good now. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so, hi, everyone. This is Belita, and I am the education advisor here in Zambia. So, Paul and I are the education advisors here in Lusaka. I just wanted to thank Alex and Jasmine for this um, great presentation. One of the things that we encounter, um, Alex and, um, and Jasmine, most of the times when we do Education, U uh, U Education USA outreach is questions about visas, uh, student visas in particular. So thank you so much for doing this. But I wanted to mention to the Zambian audience, I don't know whether this would be similar in uh, Malawi, say, but uh, for our Zambian audience, one of the things that I would in greatly encourage is to read the documents before you um, attend the interview. So uh, you receive your I-20 uh, document. You also receive other documents from the university that you'll be attending. Be well informed. Um, I think some of the things that kill us before we attend interviews, is we don't know. If we are asked a question, we are caught off guard. And some of those answers are in the documents that we have on hand. But because we didn't read the documents, we therefore don't give an accurate answer. So I just want to encourage the, the students, especially the Zambian students, have a keen interest and, and read thoroughly whatever documents you've been given by your school. Um, read that information thoroughly so that when you are in front of a consular officer during your interview, you are more confident, but you are also aware of what the accurate information is about your school and also about your circumstances. So that's just something I really want to encourage our Zambian audience. Be, be avid readers of the information that you have with you so that you are, you, you're, when you present your case, you know what you're talking about. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Belita and Faith. And, and again, Belita and Faith are your Education USA advisors. So uh, Belita works in Zambia, Faith in uh, Malawi. And so they are definitely the people who will um, be available to answer your questions. We hope for some of you, if this is your first time um, joining an Education USA event, uh, we wanted to welcome you, um, Education USA. I probably should have said this at the beginning, but Education USA <laughs> is your, basically your number one source for information about study in the US. So there's a lot of other organizations and agencies and websites out there, but Education USA is an official um, organization of the US government. And so we have the most accurate and up-to-date information about study in the US. And we have advising centers all over the world, including in Zambia and Malawi. So right now our advising centers are closed, obviously, the in-person advising, um, but we're all still doing virtual advising. You can email us. Um, I think Belita and Faith, you can go ahead and maybe post uh, our email addresses in the chat um, so students can email or WhatsApp to contact if they have further questions in the future about visas or about anything about studying in the US. So we do hope if this is your first session that you'll continue um, pursuing your goals to study in the US. It sounds like a lot of you already have been accepted to US universities, which is great. Um, we're really excited for you. And we know this can be a very confusing time right now because you may have received an acceptance, but you don't know what's gonna happen with COVID and with the visa closures. And so um, we do encourage you to just stay on the path that you're on to um, not get discouraged. We, all universities are still excited to have you and to bring you to the US as soon as possible. So just keep in touch with your universities. Um, you may have to do online classes for a short time or start your uh, school a little bit later in January or, um, or June or next August. Um, but in the meantime, you can use that time to your advantage. Um, try to um, further your studies online. Try to take up hobbies, internships, anything that you can to um, build up your resume and further your education while you're waiting for school to reopen. So we do hope that um, we'll be in touch in the future and we'll post future Education USA events on our WhatsApp group as well as our Facebook page. So please keep an eye out for that. I'll go ahead and open it back to Alice or Jasmine if you have any final comments you'd like to make. 
Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Felita. Thanks, everybody, for uh, participating. Um, just by participating, uh, even though I can't see your faces or your, your names, I, uh, it shows that you're taking initiative and that you are interested in the process, interested in learning. Um, and these are all things that are definite positives uh, from my perspective. Um, and um, I'd say um, there's always opportunities hidden somewhere. And even amidst this COVID pandemic, uh, there are opportunities. And uh, we encourage uh, students to seek those opportunities, um, uh, definitely through sources uh, like Education USA, online, online resources um, to help uh, better yourselves, improve yourselves, um, to grow uh, and learn. And, and ultimately to reach your goals, uh, whether that be studying abroad or, or anything else. Uh, but thank you for your time and attention. And um, hopefully, hopefully we look forward to seeing you at the embassy for your interview. Yeah, and also don't be too nervous. Come prepared. When you're prepared, the interview usually goes well. Know what you're going to study, know why you're going to study that particular course and everything should hopefully fall into place so hopefully we'll see you all soon as soon as the embassy is open <laughs>